Okay, everybody, I'm here with the nominees for Outstanding Achievement in Game Direction. This is the 24th Annual DICE Awards Developer Discussions. We will be talking about what makes each of these games special and makes each of the connections to these games in this category, because for the first time, we have all these folks together and hanging out together while we do our conversation today. Uh, so let's have some introductions for all the folks in the room. First up, from Ghost of Tsushima, we have Nate Fox and Jason Connell. How are you doing? Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Excited for you both to be here. Nate, give the folks at home a little bit of info about the work that you've been up to over your, over your illustrious career. Right on. Uh, well, I'm a, I come from game design uh, by way of art. My first job was animating bulls in a bull riding game. And now, <laughs> uh, you know, it's been all downhill from there. And now I just, uh, my focus as a creative director on uh, Ghost of Tsushima is game design and, and narrative. I love it. Jason, give the folks at home a little bit of info about the work you've done. Yeah, uh, I come from more of the art background. background. Uh, spent uh, the last uh, 10 years of my time uh, working on Sucker Punch games, uh, ranging from doing lighting work up until more recently on this game, getting a chance to do art direction and help it out with the creative direction of the game. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for both being here. Uh, from the team over at Hades, we have Greg Kasavin. How are you doing, Greg? Doing really well. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, give the folks at home a little bit of info information about the work you've done in this space as well. Yeah, I, I'm uh, the, the writer and creative director on Hades. Uh, I've been working at Supergiant for uh, more than a decade now on our, on our past games, uh, ever since the Bastion days. Uh, my old, old background is, uh, is in the gaming press, so I used to be a game critic uh, in my past life, though I got to chase after my uh, lifelong dream of, of kind of writing and uh, designing games, getting my hands dirty with uh, with the actual development as part of our small team at Supergiant. We're, um, we're based in San Francisco and just kind of want to stick together for as long as we can. Keep making Fantastic. stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here as well. From the team over at Half-Life Alex, we have Greg Coomer. How are you doing, Greg? Doing great. Thanks. Good to be here. Good to have you as well. Give the folks at home a little bit of information about the work you've done. Uh, I work at Valve. I've worked at Valve uh, since back when we shipped Half-Life. Uh, it's the only game, uh, it's the only job I've ever had in the game industry. Helped start Valve back in 1996, and it's been a pretty great ride since then. Pretty fantastic. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Uh, from the team over at Kentucky Route Zero TV Edition, we have Jake Elliott. How are you doing, Jake? Hi, not bad. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. Give the folks at home a little bit of info about yourself as well. Um, yeah, and so I, the, our studio is called Cardboard Computer, and it's a, a pretty small group. It's just three of us, um, and, and we, we kind of, um, before we started making games, this, we've made one game. It's called Kentucky Red Zero, and uh, before that, we, we were working on other kinds of art projects like uh, installation art and, and performance stuff for, for several years before that. So, so this game that we worked on now kind of grew out of our collaborative uh, relationship that we had already. And, um, and I'm, my role is, is to do the writing for the game and, and also some of the programming and design that we, we all kind of share, uh, programming design and sort of storyboarding stuff. But uh, yeah, that's my role. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here as well. And to round us out from The Last of Us 2, we have Kurt Maganow and Anthony Newman. How are you both doing, gents? Good. Pretty good. Great to be here. Uh, super cool to be in this group. Great to be uh, on a Zoom call with Greg Kasavin. I <laughs> totally stoked to be on a call with you. Uh, it was really awesome to see your jump from press to dev and see that go so well for you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, work at Naughty Dog a uh, little over a decade now and uh, started way back on Uncharted 2 with Kurt. We both kind of came up in the in the gameplay scripting uh, part of the dev process. Um, yeah, really great to be here. Kurt, share a little bit of info about yourself as well. Yeah, I've been, similar story. We came up together. Uh, I started about over 12 years ago, Naughty Dog. Uh, been a designer, technical designer, designer, lead designer, and various Uncharted's and Last of Us, uh, Last of Us 2, co-game co directing with Anthony. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so with much. With Neil, who is not being present here. right now. Neil is oh, sorry. <laughs> also a director with us, Neil Druckmann. Uh, awesome, out. awesome. Sorry, I, got, I, I didn't hear that last part. I cut you off by accident. Apologies for that. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you all. Again, you know, the work you've all done has been brilliant and fantastic. You've made some super awesome games in the space. You know, most of you have kind of worked in this space for 
a bunch of different years and it worked on your game for a long time, you know, thinking back to when you kind of started, you know, the process of, of, of making the games that you've made and, and kind of, you know, where things have landed, do you feel like the process itself has kind of changed you and, and, and how you kind of learned along the way of how to kind of do this work in bigger and broader and kind of bolder ways in terms of the games that you have made. Um, Greg, I'm going to go to you, Greg Kasavin, I'm going to go to you on that one first. Uh, you know, thinking about that in kind of the, the broader sense, you know, how has the game development part of, of all this kind of changed you and it made you kind of think about it broader in game direction? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the first thing that came to mind is how um, in, in my role, um, when I first started at Supergiant, you know, there's this there's this temptation as when you have this title of creative director, it's like, well, you think of these kind of visionary uh, game creators um, in the industry and, and, and you feel this pressure that, you know, the ideas must, must come from you. But um, really, I think in, it can be very successful to have an environment in which the ideas can come from, from anywhere on the team. And over time, I felt very distinctly my role evolve to become that of just trying to ensure that my colleagues have kind of the most creative freedom possible to do the work that makes them the most exciting, excited, and then uh, find ways to tie it all together and make it feel like we planned it that way uh, all from the start. Um, and, and just kind of prioritizing uh, my colleagues' excitement, even over my own, um, is something that that kind of clicked in my mind um, over time. It's not something that I uh, felt going going in, but something that I learned uh, working with the same group um, over a long period of time. Um, but uh, you know, of course, many many aspects of game development uh, have changed over time, and and it's uh, it never. I, I I often say you know with a smile, but uh, deadly serious that it never <laughs> gets any easier because just when you think. You finally know what you're doing. Uh, the whole industry changes, and you have to learn everything all over again. That certainly keeps it interesting, though. Yeah, I, I can I can assume, you know, just how much of that has actually really changed. You know, we had that conversation about you kind of starting in press and then moving over and having that that part of it change. So I'm sure that, that is not only for you a, a very different change, but for many of the folks here in the in the room as well. That's been a a monumental change in how that's worked. Um, Jake, I'm kind of curious about that, especially from your perspective, being in a really small team of you know how the process has started for you when you kind of thought about hey i'm gonna go actually try to make a game and now yeah. that you've put something out in the world what what has changed for you in that perspective yeah well first off i i just really i relate a lot to, to what greg was describing about sort of like um uh, the passion the passion of the team and, and the excitement like letting everybody sort of follow their their passion to the extent that is possible and and, and you know that was just we're, we're all the three of us are all kind of on the there's no hierarchy really for the three of us so it's like that's sort of naturally what the the arrangement was you know it's just like follow um follow the interest and, and i mean you can really see it in in your studio's work right because the, the games are all so full of passion and so many different elements and it, it just it really comes through um and i, I found for us you know we 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 sort of put some stakes in the ground in the beginning of developing the game about you know what how it was going to end in, in some form and and some things that were going to happen in the middle but we, we really tried to leave a lot of open space and leave a lot of blank spots in the story from the start uh in order to kind of give us space to follow our passions and the, the result is that sometimes the game feels very schizophrenic or, or uh, you know at least it feels very like it's going off in a lot of diverse directions but um I, I think that that kind of energy comes through that this is the sort of messy energy of a, of a group of, of artists kind of exploring whatever they were interested in at the moment that they were working on on that yeah. act and um, so that that was really important for us to sort of learn how to maintain spontaneity over the course of uh and we started working on this game in the summer of 2010 so over the course of about 10 years how to maintain spontaneity and 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 leave room for whatever it was that we were excited about eight years from now or whatever to, to sort of like find a home in, in the game. That was something that we've we've gotten a little bit better at, but we're still working on. Yeah, yeah. I, I love hearing that because it, it does kind of, you know, readjust some of the expectations that you have in your mind too about what, what that looks like from a, a broader perspective. Um, you know, Greg, I, I'd like to, to poke you about that, especially you having worked at Valve uh, for as long as you have to, to, to hear your thoughts about, you know, what has changed for you in the way that you think of you know, the process of making games in this way and, and having seen the changes from a technology standpoint, from a, 
from a conversational standpoint, from from all the ways that you've gone and kind of touched the game space, you know, how's that all kind of affected the way you've kind of thought about the process? Well, for me, I think the biggest change actually happened way back when Valve started making games. I, I wouldn't have really thought before I worked at Valve um, that our method of making games uh, would would work out very well. Uh, namely, that you know uh, we don't really have a director. Um, everybody, I, you know, just like Greg Kasavin was saying and Jake, um, even at a studio of you know now significant size and a team that is quite a few people, nobody has a job description or there's no division of labor and there's no hierarchy. And um, I think that having a game come together in an atmosphere and environment like that is is always amazing and uh you know before i worked at valve uh, you know just wouldn't have been certain that we could pull that off and uh you know worked during half-life one and worked uh you know for so many games and again on half-life alex we were you know it just was uh really an honor to be a part of the team i'm here representing the team's direction but uh it really was a kind of equivalent effort across the entire group. Yeah, it, it does really pull together into focus, you know, just how many people it takes to get a, a game out into the world. I'm always yeah. amazed at that when I hear the numbers of, of folks who are kind of in a studio and, and how many folks have spent so much time and effort and energy to kind of make a game be a thing. Uh, it is still astounding to be in that way. Um, Nate and Jason, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that too, with the lineage of games that you all kind of worked on and, you know, kind of culminating with Ghost of Tsushima, you know, what's the process look like for, for both of you in that way, where you're kind of rethinking and, and kind of broadening out, I'm sure the conversations, not only between yourselves, but with, with across the folks in the studio. Nate, I'll start with you on that one. Sure. Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, a core element that makes the game happen is the passion of the people around you that are all so invested in putting their creativity into making it, it work. And one of the things that's just changed tremendously for us, uh, you know, going from, uh, from, from Rocket Robot on Wheels all the way up to Ghost is that as the scale of the team gets bigger and the, the scope of the game gets bigger, more than ever providing uh, a sense of unified vision for what it is that everybody's working on becomes absolutely paramount so that those passions all pull in the same direction. Um, for us, that's been uh, a bit of a learning curve and uh, it is, it's, it's uh, kind of a strange work product as a, you know, as I'm sure we've all done this, you know, as directors, it's our job to get people emotionally invested for this thing that it's gonna take years to make. And so you have to be able to communicate this idea that's just an abstraction in a way that people can say, ah, I get it, it clicks in my head. Um, let's all let's all pull forward. And that I'd say is the biggest change uh, from my perspective between games that are made now versus, you know, uh, 15 years ago. And it's really just a product of the scale of the team. Yeah. Jason, any quick things to add to that? Oh, I'm just kind of amazed at like, uh, you know, the, you know, the kind of games that people can make um, from one person, three person teams, all the way up to, you know, a thousand people. It's, it's just, it's just crazy. So this is just such an evolving topic for, and it's very different for every single team. I say for, for, for Ghost in particular, uh, the, the big work environment change that I experienced over the course of this game was, was involving people that you wouldn't involve in normal game development, you know, like, you know, you know, technical artists, programmers, whatever, that's, that's very typical, but, you know, reaching out to a, a cultural consultants, mannerisms, coaches and dialect coaches and script reviewers from Japan and, you know, and just really adding a whole new category of people that help make your game was such an evolving uh, thing for us. And, and, you know, we're not directing them at all. Like they're our peers and helping kind of guide and coach us. So that, that, that was, that was profoundly different. I don't think I've ever experienced that before. So that was, that was a big learning takeaway for us at the studio. Yeah, fantastic. I, I love hearing stories about that because it is, it is a, a big task to kind of pull in all those pieces together to make it all work right. Uh, Kurt and Anthony, I'm really curious about, you know, from a, you know, from a narrative perspective, you all were going very, very big uh, and ambitious with, with the, the story you told in Last of Us 2. I think, you know, there were some parts of the overall experience 
that 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 people kind of remember and, and kind of dig into. But I'd love to hear from from both of you. You know, what parts of the the overall experience do you feel were the kind of the ones you felt were the most improved with the second game? Things you kind of really leaned into that you said, you know, we want to make sure we tackle this in a, in a, in a bigger and kind of more profound way. Um, and what were some of the lessons you kind of learned through the process of implementing those things in, in the sequel? Uh, I'll start with you, Anthony, first. Yeah, um, so we, there were so many um, things we were trying to innovate on with Last of Us Part One. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like uh, a action game with a close, third person camera kind of like gears of war but also with melee and also with stealth so there are a lot of like mechanical things that were like pretty different this ever-present ally like kind of our our most nuanced and you know complex ally that we had done yet in the form of ellie um and it was at the tail end of a console generation and so like that that game was kind of shipped on you know stuck together with bubble gum and, and bits of twine to just barely ship and in, in memory on the on the playstation 3 God, this a long time ago um and so there was a lot of stuff of just like, okay, we, we just figured this out. Um, and I think the thing that I was really excited about coming to the sequel is like, okay, let's take all of that stuff and either recontextualize it or take it to another level. Um, so it's like, okay, we, we've had combat. What does it look like when you have combat and swimming? Like, what if you are able to swim through these environments? What does it look like um, if you, you know, we've done combat and like these broken down uh, artificial environments, urban environments, what does it look like to have combat in a forest with like all this like grass all over the place in a very naturalistic space? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think for us, it was like, okay, let's not sit on our laurels. Like, and, and there were a lot of things that we were just like, oh, like there was no way we could have even like dreamed to do these things. We were just barely shipping this other thing. Now that we have this foundation, like how can we jump off of that and, and, and basically find new permutations, new, new ways of of displaying these things new content. Should we still go there? Kurt, any, any thoughts to add to that? I would say that The Last of Us, like in terms of things that we focused on, I would say like The Last of Us Part Two, for me, in like thinking about it on this high, high level, it's like a magic trick of empathy that we're trying <laughs> to get you to experience. Like we want to do this whole game as a way of making you understand why someone would do something that on the surface is very, very, very bad. Now it's kind of the whole entire concept. And we have this, this saying that we say to each other on the stick, on the stick of you know emotional moments that happen in a narrative, being able to play them uh, and things that we developed during the Uncharted series and like built sequences around and we get you know the feeling of you know, exploration or the feeling of like a, a crazy action set piece or something like things that we've been building on through the years of like making you feel in the core mechanics of the game, uh, this emo this certain emotion. And to me, The Last of Us Part Two is that taken to the macro scale of like an entire 15 hour experience uh, of playing as someone. Uh, so I guess like, that's like the heady answer. But um, to me, that's how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so hard. And I think, you know, I'm going to poke Jake about this in a second, but it's like, you know, really difficult sometimes to, you know, when you're thinking about the process of, of building out the worlds and building out those connective tissues of, you know, how much stuff do you get to, to, to infuse in the game that you know are kind of the core parts of it when, with, the, with the knowing that you're always going to have to cut bits of it because of time and scale and all those kinds of parts that go together with it. Um, Jake, I'm, I'm curious about that from 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 your perspective with Kentucky Route Zero, you know, like you've built out this really comprehensive and, and really interesting story, uh, but it feels like there's uh, there was always a little bit more that kind of wanted to be get into that into that mix. Uh, you know, how did you kind of fit all of it into into this game that that you that you've made? Um, yeah, I don't I don't think we fit everything in there that you know we were we were interested in. We have like tons of notes of ideas that we were kind of exploring and research we were doing during the game and and just half remembered ideas and stuff like that that we, <laughs> we tried to find places for and you know i i've i've heard somebody recently saying that the the way you finish a game is not by checking off the last thing on your list but by crossing it out like basically <laughs> you just move the goalposts and that's how you finish something and 
Um, so I think that was something that we did over and over again every time there was time to just, we have to put it out now. And, and then another thing that was important for us was to say, once it's out, we can't change it. You know, even though we were doing this episodic thing, we can't go back and edit earlier episodes to make it match what came later or anything. We just sort of cut off that avenue for ourselves. But um, so, so in the end, you, you do have some sort of uh, uh, some parts where there, it feels like there's maybe a little bit more, um, you know, and some of that is just really hard to see as a, as a, uh, as a writer or creator, you know, it's like really hard to tell what, uh, how much of what's in your head you put down, maybe, maybe in a, in a larger, in larger teams, a, a sort of director role could be really good for that, you know, sort of like making sure that, that, um, that things are reading the way that, um, you know, that, that each person in the team is, was sort of trying to get it to read. Um, I, I guess for us, we, we, we just kind of like play the game together as, as we're working on it. And we, and we just sort of talk about our experience with it, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's a pretty small, uh, informal process to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the, I always wonder, you know, what winds up happening when it happening, when it comes to the, you know, when you moved up the ranks and you've then become a game director, you know, how hard is it to, you know, bridge those gaps where, you know, miscommunication happens, you know, sometimes folks are new to the role and they're like, I don't know what it's like to lead a whole big crew of folks, you know, kind of in the space doing that work. Uh, and, and, and kind of infusing themselves within all the things you have to then take onto under account when you're when you're doing mm -hmm. that work, you know. Yeah, like I, if I could just follow up for real quick, sorry. The, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Please. I, I also have read about um, the discussions of, of about directing actors, uh, and and you know sort of what that what that job is like. The, the director who works with actors, and and I, I find that it seems like the director's first role is is to sort of be the first audience for the for the performers, you know, and I, I think a, a, a director a directorial role in, in game development could be something kind of similar it could be like the first player in a way to, to sort of reflect back um, to the rest of the team, you know, where where things are, are really at or something. Yeah, just, yeah, it's, 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 it's not easy, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure many, many folks have, have pulled out their hair. I'm, I'm not gonna name you Nate, because we're both bald. But that's what I'm saying. We just, we, we're just there with together. I dig it. Uh, <laughs> the fists of race <laughs> in solidarity. Um, Greg, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about when it comes to to Hades and and the very specific genre around roguelikes. I think you know, roguelikes have this, this this reputation of being super difficult, and and you know, Hades manages to 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 give players this really sizable challenge while you know bringing in new players and, and helping them to kind of understand that failure isn't necessarily a detriment. It can sometimes be a, a rewarding experience in that way. You know, how have you kind of figured out and you and the team balancing out gameplay and narrative to kind of achieve this really rewarding experiences for the audience? Yeah, um, I, I think it started with um, an observation that, that's similar to what, what you said, uh, which is that we, we felt that um, we had a point of view on this genre that we love so much that we hadn't really seen um, expressed before. Um, and, and we felt that the, the kind of the pleasures of roguelike games could be potentially made available to more types of players. Um, if, if we kind of acknowledge that the brutal difficulty that this genre is known for is more of a means to an end rather than a defining feature, the defining mm -hmm. feature of roguelike games is that they're uniquely different each time you play. So they have to kill you because if you played forever, you wouldn't be able to replay them. Um, and wouldn't be able to experience what's so cool about them. So we, and at the same time, if they're brutally difficult, um, that may get you to, you know, rage quit out or what have you. It's like, then you're also not experiencing what's great about these games. So we thought like, how can we make the experience of replaying more, more compelling and make that moment of inevitable failure uh, something that you, maybe you almost look forward to. And, and the narrative, it's funny for maybe to hear someone like me say it because uh, as, as the writer of the game, but I do look at it as kind of like a means to that end. It's like one of the tools we use to make it so that you, um, you maybe are okay with dying in this game because you know you're gonna like advance your storylines, you're gonna see your, your pals uh, in the House of Hades. Um, so it, it's something that, you know, we worked on all project long, but it was one of the very first things that we focused on. Um, so I think, you know, we always try to, uh, we, we want to have the outcome where the thing we spent the most time on turns out to be one of the best uh, aspects of the game. So I'm, I'm glad that it turned out okay, because it was a big uh, undertaking for us. 
Yeah, I, I was always curious to, to, to see how you kind of philosophize that in your minds of saying, you know, this is a thing that we want you to experience because it will kind of thrust you forward in that space and, and, and kind of give you more, more space to move, uh, which, which is kind of great. Um, if I could just great. jump in for, yeah, please. for one second. Um, just want to kind of geek out a little bit because hearing yeah. Greg Kasavin talk about what they were striving for with their roguelike game uh, is pretty great because I just have to say it worked. Uh, Hades is just fantastic. And the, the tools that you guys use to get people to enjoy playing a roguelike over and over, uh, it, it really uh, came together and, and uh, it sings in the final product. So I just got to say that's it's nice to hear you talk about it because the intention is reflected in the final product we we um we really learned so much uh, from games that came before us and and uh, people who have had way more experience uh, working on these kinds of games um than we did ourselves so we we felt like we were if nothing else kind of working in a in a tradition that we wanted to respect and try to come up with something that you know had had a reason to be within a genre that is is filled with um amazing games so yeah, nice. I, I love hearing that, and, and thank you, thank you for sharing that, Greg. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go right back to you actually, and, and talk about you know Half Life Alex in that way. You know, there are a lot of uh, things that people are, were, were really excited about when initially hearing about anything Half Life coming out into the world, um, and 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 being really excited to see anything kind of you know spark off of that original IP, you know. What were some of the conversations when you fir first kind of started the process of developing a completely new take on Half-Life for VR? What were the were the teams kind of like, oh man, we're 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 gonna do this thing now? We know we said we're gonna do it, and we're actually gonna start pushing forward with this project. And we, you know, what does that mean for 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 Half-Life? Does that mean for you know Valve and a bigger kind of conversation? What was the you know what was it like to kind of make that be be a real thing? Well, we at Valve were we had been running experiments inside the company with virtual reality for a while uh, before we really sunk our teeth into anything to do with Half-Life. And then we started to prototype some things that were Half-Life related. And by the time we, we got into that with any depth, we really quickly knew that we had something, something compelling, a kernel that we could build around. Uh, we, so we were pretty confident about that, but we were, very nervous about the idea of proceeding forward despite that confidence because we just were not sure that we could uh, g convince everyone in the world that it was worth following us in into the VR uh, space with the with the half-life genre or sorry uh, the IP um, we, we were nervous about um, announcing the game far more than we were nervous about the product we were making because uh, asking everyone to take on, you know, the equipment necessary to have this experience is a big ask. Um, but as we were building the actual game, um, there were just tons of interesting conversations, as you would expect, exploring the medium and trying to figure out how do you bring all of this um, formula, if you want to call it one, that results in a half-life like experience that has to do with combat and storytelling and you know, generally FPS compelling characters and, and bring it into this new place that's so new for everyone um, where they've got to absorb all those same things while they're figuring out, you know, how to use their body and aim a gun and, and pick stuff mm -hmm. up off the floor and, and look around. And uh, that was really fun to work through. I mean, the whole team just really, really had a blast kind of figuring out how do you balance all those things together? So it was, it was a good time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always one of those things of trying to figure out, you know, when you are, and I was, it was an interesting conversation that I had with a couple of folks about when I first heard that Alex was going to be a thing. And I, the first thought that I had was, I wonder how excited everyone was as soon as they knew that they were going to jump on this project and kind of start the, start the road down that, down that path. So I'm happy to hear that, you know, there was some cohesion in that, in, in the conversations that you were all having about for that. Um, Nate and, and Jason, I, I want to dig really quickly into, you know, you both worked on a fantastic game that was built around 13th century samurai, you know, in the year of 2020. You know, what were some of the kind of 
influences that you both brought into the game for, for, for game direction? Did you feel like there were lots of things to kind of pull in to, to, to snag and, and kind of build out the, the conversation for, for the fundamentals of that game? I'm going to start off with you, Jason, first. Yeah, for, for uh, you know, I think Nene and I have some overlap and some that are probably more personal to each other. Uh, but for me, you know, definitely uh, creating, when, when we first said we were going to create a game in you know, feudal Japan, we, you know, Nate and I had this conversation. And, uh, you know, I had, at that time, I had never really been to Japan. I was, it was on my list of places that I'd always wanted to go, frankly, because you hear how, how beautiful it is and how just exotically beautiful and, and just mesmerizing. And, you know, it's just, it was just, it was at the top of my list of places that I wanted to go to. Um, and then, you know, also interested in history and, you know, uh, you know, so for me, I got I got pretty excited about um, going down the road of watching a bunch of samurai films, <laughs> and you know, uh, I feel like I watched every one uh, ever made, uh, and so that was a huge inspiration. Creating a game that was, you know, set in an open world version of, of feudal Japan, being able to you know roam anywhere you'd like to go, um, was really super appealing. But you know, you could almost I could almost picture it before we had even started, just because of how. Um, just, just hadn't played that and seen that really. So I got really excited about that and depict how we would depict it. And, and I felt like there was just so many options that we could, we could do. And it was really exciting. And everyone we told was immediately excited about it. So that certainly helped. So definitely watching a lot of samurai movies uh, was, was a big, was a big part of my earliest inspiration for sure. Nate, what about you on that end? Oh, with, without a doubt, uh, the, the core uh, inspiration is classic samurai films like Yojimbo and uh, Seven Samurai. There's this just humanity to those films that makes you really want to take on the role of being a samurai. Pair that with an open world and an external conflict like a Mongol invasion and you know all that on top of the, the romance of feudal Japan. It's all pretty alluring. Um, but you know I think we always go back to classic samurai films because frankly, there are so many different versions of what a, a, a samurai can be. And, you know, we're, uh, Sucker Punch is an American team. And so we need to pick a lane as how we might think of that identity. Um, and frankly, also do a lot of research to make sure that when we say, okay, we're gonna go with the Kurosawa form, you know, that we rep represent it in a way that is that has a feeling of, of uh, authenticity to gamers around the world who kind of recognize things that you don't know that you know. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Jason brought it up earlier, but like having uh, uh, consultants who show you how to correctly draw a bow, you don't know that you've seen that in a movie before uh, where they you know filmed in Japan that showed you how that was the, the right way to draw a long bow. And until you have an expert you know, kind of point that out, you, you, you're just not aware. And so having a, a objective, like a character fantasy objective, then backed up with um, research and, and, and help, that's, that, that was amazing. Yeah. Well, gents, thank you very, very much for your thoughts on all of this. And now I get to do the super, super fun part of giving away our, our DICE Award for Outstanding Achievement in Game Direction. Uh, for this year, our winner for Outstanding Achievement in Game Direction goes to Hades. Goes to Hades. Congrats. Right. Nice. <laughs> yes. Greg, if you have a, a, yeah. a second or two for a couple of quick words, I know yeah. we'd love, we'd you, love to are hear. You, are, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievably humbling um, among this group. This... This group includes like my personal favorite games of the year. So it's just all the more reason, you know, I, I, I played your games and I'm, I'm in awe of them. So part of this is very surreal for me, but I, I really, um, as, as mentioned, I really owe it. I owe this to the team, my, my longtime colleagues, all seven of us who were there from the Bastion days, we're all still together. Uh, and the, the, the direction such as it is at Supergiant, in some respects, I think we've got it a lot easier uh, than than um, some of you folks because because our team is small. And I think strictly speaking, direction is easier with fewer people. I guess so. But um, we've found 
our ability to keep the team together and work past our kind of individual idiosyncrasies and be able to find these concepts that resonate personally with each of us and have the trust in each of us to kind of do our best work um, and, and seek inspiration um, from one, you know, whenever we poke our heads up from our individual work, we get inspired by the work that goes on around us. Um, that's certainly helped a lot to get to this point. Um, and, and I'm just so grateful to work with a group of people that uh, has a, put the faith in me to do what I get to do because I, it's the kind of job that I never would have gotten had I just applied for it. It took, it took a couple of friends uh, trusting me. So, um, yeah. So thank you so much uh, for, for thinking of our game for this. It's an incredible honor. Congrats, thank Greg. You. Well deserved. Yeah. Congrats, big congrats Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats, yeah. Congrats, congrats, man. Yeah. Very, very cool. Gentlemen, thank you so, so much for being with us today. Again, congratulations, Greg, for, for bringing this home for the Hades team. Uh, Nate, Jason, Greg, Greg, <laughs> Jake, Kurt, and Anthony, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, we really do appreciate the time. Um, and again, hopefully we can all do this again sometime soon in the real world. That would be fantastic to be able to hang out and chop this up uh, in those nice. ways. So again, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you all soon.